Some of the greatest evil in the world today is religious evil. Is the Christian church or Christianity more broadly really uh, under attack, do you think, in the West? It's not only under attack, it's losing the battle. Uh, Christianity has been fighting for its life for some decades, certainly since the 1960s, but now I think we have crossed a threshold into which the faith is rapidly uh, falling back, and we Christians, I myself am a practicing Christian, we aren't ready for what's happening. A lot of us still want to believe that we live in a Christian civilization. In fact, we're a post-Christian civilization, and that doesn't mean we should surrender to it. And so we find that this conundrum that we're caught up in is really some, not only something of our own making, but it's when we disconnect ourselves from what Scripture would refer to as even ancient wisdom and think that somehow because we are more viral or vibrant, that we are more advanced than ancient peoples. But many times the wisdom of age is critical to understanding how to navigate our life. As George Santianas, the famous uh, uh, Spanish philosopher once wrote that well-known quote, men who don't learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat them. And we find that that is so true, so scarily true, that as I look at our culture today where we don't really study history anymore, we study global cl climate change and global warming, but we don't study history or sociology or government. And instead we find a whole generation has no concept of where they've come or what lessons history has taught us through the centuries. And there we're guaranteed that we will therefore repeat the same tragic errors of our forefathers from ages past. And again, I would like to stress that the Western political elite and a lot of the Western culture uh, is at war with itself, at war with its own tradition. Even though it's unpopular, because as I said, if we accept the, the modernist way of reading scripture and reading religion, then the bottom is going to fall out and there's no telling what we will justify. As soon as uh, the Bible becomes just the work of man, it's no longer the work of God and exactly. everything falls apart. But the general trends don't look good in, in our societies. Uh, I think that we have to prepare ourselves to be a church that suffers. That's something really unusual for Christians in the West. We've had so many liberties for so long and been comfortable for so long, but now we're going to rejoin history, the history of the Christian church all the way back to the beginning. Normally in these political programs, we don't talk about spiritual matters, but we need to do that because you can't understand what's going on in the world today if you don't understand that underneath the political agenda is a spiritual agenda. And it's not really rational, but it's full of hatred. So don't let the form that has been given to you be altered and adjusted because of changes in culture and time. And we see that, that effect so powerfully in the age in which we live. Not only because there are so many people who want to adjust the theology to fit their lifestyle, but the fact of the matter is we have such a pervasive media digital presence in our life that we can become pounded into submission or so overwhelmed by the great lie as, as Hitler called it or Goebbels called it. If you say a lie long enough and loud enough, people will believe that it's true. And we live in such a time where we are pummeled by information oftentimes, which I can't remember who came up with the phrase, but somebody called it fake news or something like that. Our preferences become sacred. We sanctify our preferences. We say subtly to ourselves, our way is better. No, our way is best. And then eventually you're saying our way is the only way and you look down upon people who might approach things differently. You see, eventually methodology becomes more important than the message itself. How we do it matters more than what we do. But you see, efficiency starts replacing true ministry. A movement becomes kind of machine-like afterwards, and machines are lifeless, heartless, self-sufficient, and self-perpetuating. Dead orthodoxy will wrap itself in a lifeless theology that never serves 
nor makes any sacrifices, just spends all its time measuring other people and criticizing them. It's this very loss of vulnerability and humility that robs us of our spiritual vitality. Over time, biblical truth is replaced by traditions. Ritual is more important than righteousness. Power is more important than prayer. Myths and religious folklore displace history and facts. That mysticism is sought instead of the mystery of godliness. There is no rule that I could give you that would produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in your life. There's no rule I could ever give you that makes you a more loving person. In fact, what rules do, many times, is rules make us worse. Do you know any religious jerks? Some of the greatest evil in the world today is religious evil. Because it's human beings propping themselves up in arrogance, and pride is the greatest of all sin, and pushing people down. I'm right and righteous, and you're wicked and evil. And so I'm going to curse you and stone you and hurt you based on some wrong misconception and belief I have about God. Religion makes things worse. Because when we're religious, I can't love you. I'm too busy being in competition with you. And in my heart, I know I'm not right. So I'm just going to point out more and more how you're not right. So we ignore what's not right about me. Is anybody? Yeah. Christianity, I'm telling you, it's something different. Christianity is the love, mercy, grace, and truth of God offered to us in and through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we open ourselves up to it, the power of the Spirit moves in and begins to change us from the inside out. It's something different. It's supernatural. It's powerful. And so it becomes critically important for us to understand that the gospel of grace is counterintuitive. It runs counter to our way of thinking and looking at things. And so this whole idea of somehow I'm going to raise my my basic value in the eyes of God by becoming uh, more perfect or behaving in some way that somehow God would find irresistible is really a false theology, even though it's something that's quite comfortable with our manner of thinking. One of the hardest things I find for myself and anybody else is that when things become customary and comfortable in terms of how the world functions and how I think about the world, and then God presents me with a truth that is diametric to it, I have trouble understanding and accepting that. Well, this was, again, one of the most preliminary issues. And throughout the history, when you study all the various false theologies that have come into the church and been kicked out of the church, they all have at their basis the same idea that there's something that you need to do in order to qualify for heaven. There's something that you need to do. It's incumbent upon your behavior. Now, Paul knew that people would respond by saying, well, then you're giving permission to do people to do anything they want which is, again, not true at all. God's answer is really simple. If you truly know me, then you'll keep my commandments. But not because there's a list of rules that you keep plastered on the wall of your bedroom or in your living room or across the front of your TV or you carry it within your notebook, always saying, do this and do that. Think with me here. A lot of thinking today. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he didn't give a list of the big thing not to do. He gave a relational answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said this, all the law, which means all the rules. All the law and all the teachings of the prophets hang on those two relational commandments. Right relationship with God, right relationship with people. You got that one right, you got it all right. We can do rules and move the fruit around. The problem in our life is the root, it's our heart. 
Religion is behavior modification. Christianity is heart transformation. Something different. But one of the things we find is a consequence of men always trying to reinterpret God's will or nature or plan, we end up with many different religions in the world and many variations within every religion. When we look at the church history as we just read a moment ago, it says, all who believe were together, they continued daily with one accord, one in heart and mind. And yet within a, a decade of that, that unity began to fracture and fall apart. I mean, it began with distortions of the gospel message. Not gratify the desires of the flesh. This is the war I was talking about. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Have you ever noticed that rules don't change your life? You ever notice that? We have to understand that these are certain human nature issues, but also the idea that we are part of a collective enforced by government edict is not what the Bible teaches. And sadly, we see that idea is being foisted upon young people because they're convinced that they have no future and they can't do anything different. Some people think having a fear of God means you're fear, fearful of the future. No, if you fear God, you don't fear the future because you honor the God who controls the future.